Welcome to tonight's panel discussion, uh, Election 2020, What Happened and What's Next. I am Alan Gerber. I'm the director of the Institution for Social and Policy Studies and professor of political science, and I'm going to be serving as the moderator of tonight's event. Uh, ISPS is the sponsor of tonight's event. ISPS is a university research center advancing disciplinary and interdisciplinary research in the social sciences to understand our society and inform scholarly debate, democratic deliberation, and public policy. The format for tonight's event will be first uh, comments from each of the panelists. They're going to talk for five minutes or so. Um, following their, their initial comments, we're going to be having a panel discussion of maybe 15 or 20 minutes. We'll see, see how much time we have for that. And then we want to leave a half an hour, uh, for question and answer, uh, session from the part, from answering questions from the participants. Let me describe some of the logistics of that. Um, please send questions, uh, throughout the presentations using the Q&A button on the bottom of the Zoom screen. Tonight's event is being recorded. If you need technical assistance, uh, you please email isps at yale.edu. We're going to be monitoring that in case you have some technical difficulties we can help you with. Tonight's panelists, uh, I, in order of appearance, I just want to the way we're going to do this is I'm going to introduce all, all five of our distinguished panelists, and then they're going to just talk, talk in order. Um, so in order of appearance, um, tonight's outstanding panelists. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Jacob Hacker. Uh, Jacob is the Stanley Rezer Professor of Political Science, and he was the director of ISPS from 2011 until 2020. So he was the director um, right before, right before me, uh, and which was, so I have a lot, a lot to learn from Jacob. Um, Jacob is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Social Insurance, and the recipient of new, numerous awards for his, um, for his scholarship. Um, he's especially known for his, uh, writings on American politics and public policy. And he is, um, he is an expert on healthcare policy and is one of the originators and developers of the, the public option, which is a really a critical part of the um, policy debate um, on healthcare in the United States. Um, he's the author of numerous books, um, including uh, work with his co-author, Paul Pearson. And I see right behind Jacob's uh, right shoulder um, from his perspective, and I guess left shoulder from ours, is his most recent book, let them eat tweets. Um, and so, so you can, um, that's, uh, you can help make that book a bestseller. Uh, our second speaker tonight will be Christina Kinane. Uh, Professor Kinane is an assistant professor of political science at Yale, um, and a research fellow at the Institution for Social and Policy Studies. Professor Kinane studies the executive branch and political control of the bureaucracy, including the role of legislatures, executives, and the bureaucracy in policymaking. Professor Kinane is working on a book manuscript entitled Vacancy Politics, Presidential Appointments, and the Strategic Evasion of Senate Consent, which investigates how presidents strategically use vacancies to promote their policy priorities. Next, we'll hear from Isabel Omeris, the Arnold Wolfers Professor of Political Science. Maris studies a range of topics in comparative politics and political economy, including democratization, clientelism and corruption, taxation and fiscal capacity development, and social policy reforms in both developed and developing countries. Her recent book, co-authored with Lauren Young, is Conditionality and Coercion, Electoral Clientelism in Eastern Europe. And that book won the American Political Science Association's extremely uh, prominent and eminent award, the William Riker Award for Best Book in Political Economy. So we'll hear from Isabella. After Isabella, we get David Mayhew. Again, we're going in alphabetical order. David Mayhew is Sterling Professor Emeritus of Political Science 
a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the National Academy of Sciences. That's the t trifecta, I think, in, in the social sciences. So congratulations to David. Um, David is a renowned scholar of American politics, an expert on pretty much everything. Uh, he's a, the author of perhaps the most influential book on Congress of the last 50 years, Congress, The Electoral Connection. He has a lot of other books. Every one of them is well worth reading. Uh, America's Congress is an, a really nice one, um, 2000. I, I really like that one. And then um, Divided We Govern may or may not be the, the book to turn to, depending on how things go in January. Um, and finally, we'll be hearing from Saad Omer. Uh, Professor Omer is a, is a specialist in infectious diseases and vaccination policy. In 2020, I don't know that there's any post-election panel that can, uh, can be formed without having an expert on infectious diseases uh, like Saad as part of the discussion because of the extraordinary importance of, uh, of our public health policy. Um, over the last year and in the coming year. Um, professor Omer is a professor of medicine at the Yale School of Medicine and the Susan Dwight Bliss Professor of Epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health. He's a fellow in the, in fact, fellow of the, oh, excuse me, he's the director of the Yale Institute for Global Health and a fellow of the Infectious Diseases Society of America, winner of awards for his scholarship on the um, impact of immunizations. He conducts research um, on interventions to increase immunization coverage and acceptance. Again, an incredibly critical public policy issue in the coming months. Professor Omer served as an academic affiliate of the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team under, I guess it was Barack Obama. And he is on the advisory panels for the important uh, vaccination, um, you know, tr trying to understand, uh, what policies need to be set regarding the vaccination approvals and distribution. He's on both the United States panel, advisory panel, uh, for the vaccines as well as the WHO panel. So, so he is a, um, he is a, uh, a real expert on this incredibly important public policy issue. Um, welcome to all of, all of our panelists. Um, one last thing before we turn it over to these distinguished panelists. Uh, in, if, you, if you enjoyed today's event, uh, there's more. Uh, we're having another, another event December the 1st at 7.30, 7.30 to 8.45. Tonight, uh, tonight's panelists and our discussion will be focused to some extent a bit more on the macro picture, uh, public policy, um, governance. On the 1st of December, we have a more of a political behavior heavy panel. So if you want to know things about what the voters did and why did they do it, you'll get some of that tonight, I would imagine, but you'll get a lot of it on December 1st at 730. For that panel, we'll be having Alex Kopik and Josh Kalla from the Yale Political Science Department to political behavior scholars, as well as Mike Podhorzer, who is the assistant to the president of the AFL-CIO for strategic research. Uh, Mike is a incredible expert on the nitty gritty of America, the American voter and American political behavior, especially contemporary American political behavior. We'll also be having Lynn Vavrick, who has been conducting a tremendous amount of survey research during the campaign. And she's an expert on presidential elections and campaign effects in presidential elections. So if you're interested in that angle, the political behavior angle, on December 1st at 7.30, please look out for the ISPS event, What Did Voters Do and Why Did They Do It? With that, let me turn it over to, um, to our panelists who will speak without any intervening interruption in, in their in alphabetical order. So please uh, kick us off, Jacob. Great. Thanks so much. 
Thanks so much, Alan. Um, thanks to Lamore Pierre and Pam Green for doing the, the back backside tech um, and preparation for this event. And uh, thanks to this amazing group of panelists. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be with you. Um, I also appreciate Alan's uh, mentioning the book. Um, I see we have about 245 attendees, so you could double my book sales if you, you all went on and bought the book. Um, well, I think we all should celebrate. It's now official. Um, Charles Koch has said that the winner is Joe Biden. So we should just like all be clapping. Um, for those who didn't read the interview with uh, with the uh, elder Koch brother, um, the surviving of the two that um, are associated with conservative political causes, um, he also went on to say that he was really sorry that he messed up American politics with all his investments, uh, to which uh, the Twitter Twitterati um, responded with, uh, with a mix of humor and contempt. Um, here's my favorite. Uh, you, he said, I, you know, something to effect of, we really screwed things up is what Coke said. He, this is the response. You can screw up a cookie recipe. You can screw up parallel parking. Those things can be shrugged off and repaired. You can't screw up a country, its elections, its media landscape, a major political party and just say, oops, my bad. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, that major political party, because I think we should first recognize that the electoral defeat of a would-be authoritarian is a very big deal. I, I think Joe Biden would add a, another word to the, to the description between big and deal, but this is a major accomplishment. Um, but I think as, as Paul and I had argued, Paul Pearson and I argued in our book, Let the Meet Tweets, uh, which begins with the line, this is not a book about Donald Trump, um, Donald Trump is not the sole reason, um, as uh, Charles Koch's comments suggest, that our democracy has not been working as well as it could or should. Um, and I think the election delivered a, a kind of split verdict um, on the future of American democracy. On the one hand, as I said, um, would-be authoritarians are rarely defeated at the polls, and democratic backsliding, as the comparativists call it, could have continued much more quickly uh, had Donald Trump been reelected. But at the same time, the fact that Republicans actually gain seats in the House um, may well hold on to the Senate. It seems like the more likely outcome. I'm sure David will give us examples of every uh, off <laughs> every uh, runoff race in the history of the United States to uh, analyze the prospects. Um, but it seems likely that Republicans will hold the Senate and thus that Mitch McConnell will be the majority leader. Um, and so that, and that um, is obviously going to mean that um, the pr president elects ability to achieve many of the goals he set out during the campaign will be limited. It also means, and I think this is, really important um, to understand is that the the pressures on the Republican Party to change course are going to be less than they might have been otherwise. Um, back in in the in the late, uh, well, actually, the early 2010s, uh, Barack Obama famously asked whether the GOP fever will break. Um, and that fever, unfortunately, still seems to be raging. Um, the um, the, the other thing I want to just mention, and I think we should talk about tonight, is the extent to which this, um, this party that has been radicalized over the last generation um, has managed to in, in, insulate itself from electoral accountability in many ways. Um, the fact is that Republicans have burrowed into America's counter-majoritarian institutions. Uh, they hold a, 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 their appointees hold a decisive uh, majority on the Supreme Court and lower courts. Uh, it's a notable fact that uh, the 6-3 majority on the Supreme Court is uh, a good chunk of the people who uh, constitute it were uh, either or both uh, appointed by a president who uh, did not win the popular vote or um, confirmed by a Senate majority that did not represent a majority of Americans. And we know that the Senate is heavily tilted uh, towards rural America, and that rural America is heavily tilted toward the Republican Party. And we also know that the Electoral College has become uh, a much uh, a, a, an advantageous terrain for the Republicans. So there's a variety of reasons why Republicans are under less pressure to moderate, um, even though the most extreme instantiation of the Republican retreat from uh, from the center, Donald Trump, was defeated. 
So I'll just close in my last few minutes by mentioning, um, you know, what I consider to be the kind of a half full or half empty uh, version of our democratic glass right now. So on the one hand, as I said, I think we've seen a clear rebuke uh, to a president who um, in, has continued to um, flout democratic norms and who, as I said, represented a clear and present danger to American democracy. Um, on, on the other hand, the fact that we have Republican silence or worse in the face of a failed president de- continuing to delegitimate our elections is an extremely worrisome sign that we're going to see uh, continuing intense fights uh, over the future of American democracy and American politics. The base of the Republican Party is thoroughly Trumpian. The structures of organized outrage that have supported him remain in place. Uh, indeed, Fox News now looks like a moderate alternative to other sources of information for conservatives. And finally, uh, we know from history that obstruction has paid off for the Republican Party. Mitch McConnell, once again, will uh, be in the position of deciding what is possible for an incoming uh, Democratic administration and will almost certainly say, as he did back under President Obama, that his top priority is to make the Democratic incumbent a one-term president. How will it end up? Let's stay tuned and let's discuss it tonight. Okay, well, thank you, Jacob, and thank you, uh, Alan and Pam and Memor for all of uh, your organization efforts. I am thrilled to be here to be a part of this um, uh, incredibly amazing uh, panel uh, and uh, to kind of, you know, discuss and, and digest a bit of what we've experienced politically uh, for the last year of the election, uh, for the last four years of this current administration to kind of look forward. Um, the, the topic of this panel being, uh, you know, the, this what happened and what's next. Uh, Jacob, uh, you, you led us off with such a wonderful uh, set of, of, of thoughts on how we might consider uh, moving forward with the Republican Party as it is. I'd like to add a little bit of my own uh, flavor to that mix and, and, and think through or at least, you know, start the conversation on one of the pillars that the Biden campaign really ran on, which was the administration's handling or uh, some might say mishandling of the of the COVID-19 epidemic. And, and what that really shines a bright light on is uh, the way in which the administration has handled uh, appointments to uh, the federal bureaucracy and the way that the administration has ran and managed our government uh, or, or mismanaged, as, as some might say. Um, and, and particularly thinking through exactly what happened in the, in the last four years, the Trump administration is leaving us with, with a federal government that is led by mostly acting officials. And these oftentimes are, or not oftentimes rather, almost entirely not vetted by the Senate. They're not confirmed by the Senate. They're filling those positions on a, on an interim capacity. But under the Federal Vacancies Reform Act, they're only supposed to serve for a limited amount of time. And Trump has, ex- has, has exceedingly um, either just blown past those deadlines or submitted nominees uh, to a Senate who, as, uh, as, as Jacob so nicely um, put, is run by Republicans and you would think would then confirm his appointees, but aren't. They aren't confirming his appointees. Uh, this leaves these actings uh, in those positions. We've seen a variety of things come down where those actings are potentially not uh, uh, legal. They're potent- they're, the decisions that they make are not legal. Uh, most recently with acting uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, Chad Wolf. And what this, what the question this brings is what the Biden administration can do in the process of transitioning. When you transition to a new administration, you're reliant on the individuals who are filling the positions at this time. And oftentimes, uh, in that transition, you'll see the top cabinet positions set off and the deputy secretaries take over for a short amount of time to kind of fill the gaps as an acting. But when you have acting deputy secretaries or you have vacancies in those acting deputy secretary positions so that the, uh, someone can move up into the acting secretary position itself, this, this calls into question exactly how the Biden administration is going to get their feet under them and get off onto a good start in, in, and, and really when our conversation turns to what's next, that's what we have to start thinking about with the Biden administration, um, 
transitioning out of this election and thinking about the hurdles that already exist to, to a new administration. You have 1,200 uh, presidential appointments that require Senate confirmation to be filled. Now we can have a conversation at a later time as to whether or not that is necessary. The politicization of the federal government certainly uh, is, is questionable for, for a lot and has been a subject of, of research for political scientists. But, but when we, when we think as to what Biden's going to be able to achieve, as Jacob mentioned, um, he's going to need to rely on those appointees. And if, if he is stymied, um, by the Senate in terms of confirmation, Trump has really laid out there, uh, almost a, a playbook for pursuing his own, uh, strategies of appointments, um, outside of the Senate. So I'm, I'm excited to kind of think through, uh, what that means as well, uh, with the rest of the, the rest of the panel. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much uh, to Ellen for um, inviting me to be part of this panel and um, to um, Pam and Limor for organizing. So as uh, Ellen mentioned, um, I am um, uh, studying comparative politics. Uh, and so this identity, in fact, helps me today because quite honestly, there's so much about the 2020 elections that I don't understand. Okay, so, <laughs> so at the time Alan has asked me to be part of this roundtable, I wouldn't have anticipated that we would be today nearly two weeks after the election in this ambiguous situation, which is a slow motion coup d'etat. So the outgoing president has not yet recognized the legitimacy of the election, nor has he yet conceded defeat. While perhaps this is unsurprising for Donald Trump, what is more worrying about democratic erosion is that the Republican Party is complicit with the strategy. Nearly half of the political class elected to the Senate and to the House today are complicit in a strategy to delegitimize a democratically elected president. Yesterday, the Washington Post reported, based on interviews of the Georgia Secretary of State, that Senator Lindsey Graham tried to pressure him, the, the Georgia Secretary of State, to find ways to exclude legal ballots. So how does this moment in time, how does this unprecedented democratic fragility of the United States fit in the democratic landscape of eroding democracies. So I want to draw attention to the fact that if we look in a comparative setting, the situation in the United States is bleak. So hearing about this episode yesterday, I, want, I was reminded about Nancy Bermeo's very important book, Ordinary People in Extraordinary Times. I don't know how many of you here are familiar with this study, but to my knowledge, this is the best account of democratic erosion we have in comparative politics. This is a study of 18 countries that experienced democratic breakdown in Europe and Latin America during the interwar period in the 60s and 70s. Bermeo asks the simple question, what distinguishes cases that remain democracies from cases where democracy ultimately collapsed? Her main result is highly relevant for the situation of the United States today. The study zooms in on the importance of elite behavior and on a variable that Bermeo calls distancing capacity. She defines distancing capacity as the ability of members of the incumbent party to distance themselves from the behavior of their, from the lawless behavior of their co-partisan allies. And I end the quote. So evidence of such distancing capacity comes in the form of condemnation of lawlessness or the prosecution. This was present in Finland and the Czech Republic in the interwar period. And this was where these members of the dominant elite sanctioned violence or transgressions of democratic norms, but was absent in countries that sort of right where democracy collapsed. So what is remarkable about the United States today in broad co a comparison to these historical cases is that it takes extremely low measures on the variable measuring distancing capacity. Moreover, I cannot see a way how this distancing capacity can be established within the Republican Party who the actors of change are, and what sanctions they may have at their disposal to enforce this behavior among their co-partisans. So at this critical historical juncture, Republicans are complicit with Trump's decision to deny the legitimacy of election just to increase their bargaining power with a new president. So this, in my view, creates a very somber scenario for the Biden presidency, who will have to devote considerable energy to fight off accusation of illegitimacy in the eyes of sort of about 30% of the voters. So the future, in my view, is bleak. Okay. So turning now to the elections, I have sort of one or two kind of, you know, thoughts about the outcome of the election. And they have to do with the nature of populist appeal. The elections have yielded very ambiguous results that I find quite difficult to understand. So even though President Trump lost the election, over 70 million voters voted for him. 
This comes in the middle of an unprecedented pandemic and the disastrous response of the federal government to this public health crisis. So this is really puzzling for most explanations in political science that highlight the ability of voters to sanction bad politicians, especially in moments of economic crisis. Okay, at the same time, the election has yielded very ambiguous results for Democrats. Even if President Biden won the popular vote, the election has not been successful by most Democratic candidates down ballot. The Democratic majority in the House has shrunk and no Democrat competing in red states has been reelected. So what explanations do we have in political science to make sense of these results? This suggests to me that we have really not fully appreciated the power and strength of populist appeals. So what do I mean by populist? So even though we have experienced four years of a populist president, it's quite hard to explain what they do. They govern through provocation. They govern through the creation of enemy, the fake media, the quote unquote rapist migrants, the quote unquote Chinese virus. What populists do is that they introduce in the policy discourse a new dimension that is orthogonal to the existing policy dimension. And so they govern by flaming up this rhetoric of opposition of elites. And so this is what we call in political science, thin populist, anti-elitist sort of strategies. So we don't have a good explanation of how these messages work. And we a priori dismiss them as being kind of the theatrics of a populist. But I think we don't fully understand how this populist rhetoric was successful to maintain the electoral coalition of Trump in the face of the dramatic economic shock of the pandemic. So let me again, turning to the pandemic, right? How did Trump respond to the pandemic? Like other populists around the world, he had two strategies, anti-scientists denying the existence of the virus and sort of the anti-foreign strategies blaming foreign countries such as China on the virus. So to understand sort of right how these messages sort of right have helped him uh, maintain support among sort of right this, these 70 million voters, which I mentioned above, it's important to think about sort of right the two effects of sort of right populism. One is that this orthogonal dimension of political competition creates a really difficult choice for other parties whether or not to engage with this issue. Should the Democrats have responded to all this nonsense about the Chinese origin of the virus? But I do think the more important consequence of these messages is that they have spillover effects on the main axis of political competition, the left-right dimension. So in other words, what populist messages do is that they depress the support for policy or the demand for policy, even among groups that are very severely hurt such as right, voters who have experienced COVID or have experienced downturn. And we have sell lots of sort of right survey evidence that I have collected with colleagues here during the pandemic sort of right documenting this. That calling sort of right, sort of, if you expose to voters to these messages of the virus is a hoax that in fact depresses their demand, okay, for, for policy of voters that have experienced an income shock. So I do think this is sort of right part of the explanation of this puzzle, why Trump was able to maintain his electoral coalition intact during a pandemic without providing any policy response and by engaging in thin populist messages only. This is what Barry Weingas has called elsewhere the tragic brilliance of the populist. And I think kind of this, this sort of thin populism explains another sort of right puzzling outcome of the election, which is the growing educational and geographic polarization of the electorate. So voters without college education have to be, appear to have resonated most strongly to these anti-elitist messages and sort of right, and by tapping into this anti-elite resentment, these messages have undermined the support of these voters for a distributive policy such as college credit or Medicare for all, all advocated by the candidates. So I will end <laughs> with these, these comments. I'm su suggesting that sort of right, we as political scientists have a sort of right, deeper obligation to really understand sort of right, the importance of these messages um, in, in creating this, uh, this very paradoxical result that we have seen in this election. Done it. Okay. <clears throat> well, thanks for inviting me, uh, Alan. <clears throat> I'm going to say very, very quickly what happened and what's next, which was what we're supposed to do. What happened? <clears throat> I think the election is a considerable victory for moderation and probably for a coalition government of the American sort. I think the fever is down. That is, with Trump dispatched, 
and the left pretty much staved off, the fever is down. That is, the menace that each side sees in the other side is substantially diminished on, on, both, on both sides. The Democrats gained the presidency and the vice presidency by a considerable property of majority, as it happens, and one and net one Senate seat. Republicans gained something like 10 House seats and one governorship and two state legislative chambers, and conservatives had some notable victories in the referendum process processes. In a lot of ways, it's a standoff. Though, of course, the presidency is a big prize, and now Biden gets it with a substantial popular edge. I think the coalitions this year, voter coalitions, are basically a continuation of ones that we've seen for 20 years or so and an evolution of them. We've been evolving into a, a kind of class cleavage between diploma people, that is, a college diploma people, and non-diploma people. It is a cleavage that would have surprised Marx, but there it is. You'd have to rewrite the whole business. But it's a, it looks like a class cleavage. It's a cleavage of interests that are preferences and of attitudes that I don't think political science studies particularly well. I think the election was nicely conducted. It's a great success. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of previews there saying it was previews saying it was going to be a terrible mess. And even though some votes came in late, we knew that was going to happen. It's ordinary processes, a little extraordinary this year because of COVID, but quite defensible and I think uh, properly handled processes. There seems to be no fraud and uh, little disorder, just footnotes of disorder here and there that can be ignored. Uh, Trump isn't, Trump's denial is not going anywhere. It seems to be a kind of closing tantrum that he's engaging in that may go on for another week or so. It's, um, it won't go anywhere. It doesn't have anything to do with the, with the, uh, with the who holds the office. It's, um, it, uh, the complaints will go on that the election was unfair. It's a somewhat different matter of, of, of uh, difference of whether it can be overturned on the, on the evidence. Unfair. But we've seen that before. In fact, we saw it after the 2016 election. It's unfair. It was Russia and all that. It's a page out of Andrew Jackson. Remember him with the uh, charging for four years was a corrupt bargain. Of course, it didn't affect. It was John Quincy Adams of the White House during those four years. We, we're not getting resistance in the streets last time as the way we did last year after the 2016 election. All in all, as I say, I think the fever is down. It's a victory for moderation. I think maybe the democracy is dying script should be put back in the file cabinet. <clears throat> That's the what happened. Now, the what next? I think one main effect, event going on into governing is that there'll be more day to day and week to week stability in the White House. That is not a minor thing. There's firing people and expostulation, and changes, erratic. That's, that's going to go away. It's a good thing it goes away, particularly probably for the conduct of foreign policy. I think that in governing Biden, President Biden, President-elect Biden, can do a great deal with executive directives, and we'll see that in the fashion of Obama and Trump. This kind of a ping-pong category, character to that. One president does think, and the next president takes it back, and the next president may do it again, but it's important, and some of it sticks. So we'll see executive orders of some importance, and that this president has come in, got to do something in a hurry, as Trump did early on, and that will be the sort of that will be what Biden does in a hurry. Climate change. We'll go back to the Paris Paris Accord sooner or later. The pipeline hanging down from Canada won't be built. The business regulations will be taken away. There'll be no immigration and so forth. But there, there'll be a lot of ruling by Zeusian diktats from the White House and the bureaucracy. That'll be there. But there are limits to executive orders uh, that are not executive orders and not executive directives more generally are not embedded in statutes. And so they, they, um, they're perishable as Trump's, will, as we'll find out, some of Trump's are. And the courts are out there. The courts are, are probably going to got to bulk up in their policing of bureaucratic diktats, given the doctrines that are in the heads of some of those new justices. So, so there we are. It's, um, it's, um, there we are. Now, I think on Capitol Hill, 
we're going to have narrow majorities, whatever else happens, a narrow majority in the Senate, a none, a narrow majority in the House. It looks like formal divided party control, which is, after all, normal in American politics, 70 percent of the time since 1980 is the normal way of governing. We can't be sure it'll be formally divided party control because we now know about Georgia, Georgia down there. We got those two Republican seats hanging, and they, there it is. It's a, and I, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not holding my breath for the Democrats to take both of those seats. It's difficult. The uh, the, the track record, as somebody mentioned, I would talk about the track record of of, um, of um, runoffs in Georgia has been pretty favorable to the Republicans, and I see they're dumping it an awful lot of money in public. So who knows? We just don't know. A lot of it will depend on what happens during the next eight weeks, after all. Elections are to some degree... Uh, Reactions to what happened? We got six weeks before those elections or before that election is held in Georgia. Another thing will happen on Capitol Hill. Well, with divided party control, it's dependent on on the Georgia seats. But there's Joe Manchin there anyway. Even if the Democrats pick up those those two Georgia Senate seats, then probably Joe Manchin, the conservative Democrat from West Virginia, becomes the pivotal senator on some matter. So. He's already gone on saying it's taking some positions that the party doesn't like. Uh, also on Capitol Hill, it is, uh, the Democrats in the House are having trouble uh, arraying themselves and picking a leader. Than any of I think Nancy Pelosi is going to get restored as Speaker, though she's going to have to fight for it for every last person. Every 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 last person. There are. The majority is a narrow, both sides, and the Democrats in the House look like something like 223 to 212, something like that. It's narrow. It's uh, in Georgia, yeah, yeah. So we'll just, we'll, we'll just, we'll just, I already said that. It looks like we'll just have to say before factions. Now, that is fierce scrapping. Some of it has come out in the press during the last week or two between the progressive faction and the moderate faction and so on which makes it very hard to run that party. But I want to say this. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, there's a tendency to blame the leadership in Congress if if there is, because they can't herd the cats sometimes, some of that. But we should realize that factions within parties on Capitol Hill are very common in American history, indeed possibly normal. Sometimes they're not so easy to see as with the Tea Party faction, which didn't, didn't show up with a roll call voting because the party leaders could at least arrange what had been voted on in the four to minimize their apparent, to, to minimize their real factionalism. So it's, it's a tough job that Nancy Pelosi has got, but we should realize that. We shouldn't blame her or blame the Democratic Party if they're killing each other. It's, 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 and some of them, believe me, I think some of those people like to kill each other right now among the House Democrats the way they're talking. We'll see. But a f- faction, factions in Congress are an extrusion from the society, and a normal extrusion from the society. So let's not blame the party or the leaders. On to Capitol Hill, it's um, the Democrats' ambitious legislative program is not going to happen, almost certainly not going to happen during the next couple of years, or probably the next four years, given the numbers. It's um, There's a list of things that probably won't happen. We won't have um, police reform the way the Democrats would like it. There'll be no Green New Deal. There'll be no ban on fracking. There'll be no Medicare for all. There'll be no public option, it looks like. There'll be no $15 minimum wage. There'll be no ban on right-to-work laws. There'll be no contract unionization. They had a long platform. You know, some of this is platform, and some is just the sort of stuff the parties wanted to do for some time when they get a chance. There'll be no election reform. There'll be no big tax hikes. There'll be no cart packing. That's not going to go. And they're not going to get rid of the filibuster or even tamper with the filibuster. I thought two or three weeks ago that the Democrats are going to have enough, a big enough majority in the Senate to, 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 to cook the filibuster, at least cook a lot of the life out of it. But that's, that's not going to happen right now. Joe Manchin says, no, they can't touch it. All this is not going to happen. If Joe Manchin, the Democrat, does become the pivotal member, then some of this alters. I mean, Joe Manchin apparently is open to some tax, some tax take back, some tax coalition making, which might, the party, the Democrats might be able to put through, through reconciliation in a 50-50 Senate that includes Manchin with them. That's there. But all this other stuff, it's not clear that some, the Manchin question would make a, would make a difference. Be, be aware though that 
that um, ashes to ashes, that is a personnel, a personnel change. There's some important change, some important changes to the coalitions of the Congress happened because people die and retire, as with Teddy Kennedy back in, tragically in 20, 2010, you remember that. And in the past, uh, people defecting or people dying or people retiring, people going to the cabinet have affected the coalition control on Capitol Hill or close to it. So we can't, anyway, there's no, there's no crystal ball that can take us into that one. But I would say finally that without this program, without an ambitious legislative program, I, I don't, I, don't, I think if, with Biden's presidency, there's not so much space for hot and betting for, uh, for, 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 is my picture up there? It's at the top, right? <laughs> no, you're, David, no, you're absolutely, your picture is, is perfect. Um, you're coming up to about, about 10 minutes. So, um, and you'll have an opportunity to, um, to, right, to amplify, amplify on some of these themes during the question and answer and panel discussion. Is there a final thought you'd like to leave us with before we move on? Biden's got a tough presidency. It's got to be an inbox and management presidency like Harry Truman's, not a legislative program presidency. It's a very tough four years coming up. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Saad Omer. So, hi. Um, um, You must be, might be wondering what an epidemiologist is doing here. And there's one explanation. Um, Since, uh, Everyone went home uh, on March 15th. Um, there's a, um, an oversupply of armchair epidemiologists. So, you know, maybe I'm taking revenge, uh, uh, you know, on um, other fields by becoming uh, an armchair political scientist um, in this, um, you know, in this post-election season. No, it's, that's not the reason. Um, the reason I'm, I'm here is because... Uh, this pandemic uh, response in the U.S. has been a failure. Um, there is no other way to describe it. Uh, those of us who um, have been working on infectious diseases, including pandemic pre- preparedness, my first interaction and my first serious effort was actually around 2006, um, when it, H5N1 influenza was a was a risk, um, and so on and so forth, and was engaged with some work around H1N1, and a lot of people had expected that uh, there could be a virus which would um, impact the U.S. in the way it is impacting us now, which would lead to deaths, even more deaths, or could lead to deaths uh, in higher numbers. But no serious scholar um, had imagined, uh, and have asked around, I have asked people, that if we were, we always thought if we were this bad in terms of mortality and morbidity, not necessarily spread, but specifically mortality, there will be a hundred other countries worse than us. Um, and, and there was uh, a, for example, the, the latest Global Health Security Index um, ranked, uh, which was just came out in 2019, ranked the U.S. as number one. Um, and... Obviously, we are not number one, um, at least not in a positive sense. And the reason why I'm here is that it's not a failure of science. We have had PCR and antigen tests and social distancing and masks and vaccines, although these are newer types of vaccines, uh, but the overall vaccine approach for decades. What failed wasn't science. What failed was governance. And and in public health, if uh, I want to prepare for the next pandemic, I can't do that without um, an approach that involves a serious, mature, hard-nosed look at governance. And governance, you know, uh, you know, it is said, I know, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are aware that um, uh, democracies don't have famines. Um, uh, you know, I'm paraphrasing um, uh, someone, obviously. Uh, but democracies have pandemics and uh democracies make a mess, uh, it seems, of uh, pandemic response. So so that's the reason why we need to discuss this. The why, that, that's why institutions are important. That's why appointments are important. That's why prominence of career folks and political appointees in, in decisions uh, and uh, random radiologists from Stanford uh, is, is important. Um, and so... Um, one of the things going forward would be important is trust in institutions. 
And, and on, part of my work is focused on vaccine acceptance uh, and trust in vaccines. And a lot of it, a lot of people that they, you have seen uh, different surveys. We, when we looked at it, uh, it was in May, and we found only 67% would uh, um, sort of right away accept the vaccine. The rates for, through other surveys, Pew and others, have actually gone down of outright ex- acceptance. And these are not your run-of-the-mill um, vac- anti-vaccine folks. There's a huge chunk of folks who are who, sus- who were suspicious of the process, who saw what happened with uh, hydroxychloroquine, who saw what happened with convalescent plasma, where there was perhaps a reason uh, to um, issue emergency authorization. And you could argue, have a good faith argument about the merits or demerits of that. But the way it was projected, the way it was politicized, freaked a lot of people out. And since then, there has been a course correction at the FDA through due to pushback of the career folks, uh, but also um, uh, uh, due to um, pushback of the political appointees at the FDA as well. But the general public doesn't know. Um, and so therefore, we need to, the fact that I'm seeing um, this huge gap in the response um, in terms of serious investment in vaccine confidence and serious investments in a national education and communication campaign. Public health has, you know, this is not the first time uh, there has been a public health response, but whenever we have had a major national or international level response, we've had an evidence-based um, education and communications campaign. It's, and, and, and a communications campaign is not run through press conferences or or tweets uh, exclusively. Social media is obviously a part of all of this stuff, but it has to be coherent and it has to be um, reasonably um, evidence-based. And so I'll share a piece of data that uh, we generated in collaboration with um, Alan and uh, Greg Huber and a really talented um, postdoc from political science, uh, Scott Bocamper, uh, where we uh, had these survey experiments where we found that even if you had approval of the vaccine a week before the election versus in December, there would be a much higher acceptance and confidence in vaccine uh, if it were approved in December. And then we did this um, uh, survey experiment way before the election, several weeks before the election. Um, and so, so that is reassuring. We also found that elite endorsement by uh, Dr. Fauci, by Tony Fauci, but also bipartisan endorsement could move people. So that kind of evidence is there. In the context of vaccines, uh, I have looked at the impact of liberty and purity values. So extending some work, borrowing some work from Jonathan Hyatt, uh, and looking at it in the context of vaccine decisions, whether they are moral decisions or not. Turns out a lot of these decisions are moral decisions. Um, and uh, some of these, uh, and I've been looking at specifically at liberty and purity for a while, and because of uh, these authoritarian strains that have come to uh, that have become more prominent in, in other fields as well, in terms of pushing back against other public health interventions, we are seeing uh, you know some of that work is newly relevant uh, in this particular context. Uh, so I will wrap up by saying that you know moving forward, there are a lot of things that concern us public health types, um, uh, governance. Um, is at the top of it, but also uh, um, based on the composition of the courts, um, one of the things that makes me nervous is that the foundation of a lot of public health law is this decision that was done around uh, smallpox mandatory vaccination, Jacobson versus Massachusetts. Um, and that um, has, and that sort of, in a way, um, uh, uh, explicated the police powers uh, of the state um, in the modern era or relatively modern era, that decision was of the progressive era at the turn of um, the 20th century. Um, and that decision has spawned a lot of thinking, a lot of mainstream, both legislation and uh, regulation. Uh, with the new composition of the court, uh, I'm not sure uh, that we can take those kinds of interventions for granted, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of my work has been on the using um, uh, behaviorally designed legislation uh, as a public health intervention. And so there are certain things that we took for granted. I don't think we can take it for granted. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to discuss several things. Um, and, and just to reassure everyone, this is not a revenge. I'm just great crashing because you're a fun lot. 
All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Saad. Um, and, and thank you to all the panelists. So um, we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience. I just wanted to remind everyone that um, when we conclude the panel discussion in about 10 minutes or so, looking at the clock, um, I'll start with uh, some of the questions that are being sent in uh, to the question and answer function. Um, and there, um, some of the questions are, are the questions I've been trying to read them while also paying attention to my colleagues. And the questions are, are outstanding and some of them are kind of long. So it's, it, I'm doing my best to sort of remember, like, like balance all of this. So good, good luck to me. Um, for now, let me just start with just a couple questions and then we'll go to question and answer. So my first question, um, to the panel is, um, there's a difference of opinion on the panel. Maybe people noticed, uh, that there was a little bit of a difference of opinion regarding how concerning uh, the post-election period um, ought to be. I think, if I remember correctly, Isabella, I believe, called it a slow-motion coup d'etat, uh, and I believe David uh, referred to it as um, the menace has diminished, and we're we're now kind of getting back to to normal. We've gotten rid of Trump on the one hand, and that's what the the you know the Democrats and we're concerned about, and we, the election was not a resounding blue wave, which, um, which was what the Republicans were worried about. So we're kind of, uh, the temperature has gone down and we're, um, we're now, um, entering a, a period of, uh, of a more calm, um, and more nor normality, or well, I, I guess I don't, I, I don't have his exact words. Um, so Isabella and David and anyone else who wants to um, wants to enter into the conversation here, David, why um, why aren't you more worried? Uh, and uh, and Isabella, um, uh, could you re then respond to what David has to say about why he's not more worried by the things that are clearly worrying you? And if anyone else wants to jump in, of course, uh, uh, feel feel free to do so once Isabella and David have had a had a moment to exchange their views on this. Uh, they, okay. I th look, I think that this, in order to contest an ele election successfully, you need to have some cause to do it, some empirical cause to do it, like the very close vote in Florida in 2000. And that, that, that difficulty carried all the way to the courts, but it was a 600 vote or something like that difficulty. They had to see what went on and they had to look to see and fight about what went on. Nothing like that is happening this year. They're just telling stories. The Trump people are just telling stories. That's about it. Yeah, so I um, I agree with Professor Mayhew that, uh, I mean, clearly this um, this election, um, you know, um, went surprisingly well, given that was what was anticipated. Um, and there was no post-electoral violence, the sort of right, very little fraud, very little irregularity. So all this industry of, you know, worry about a democratic erosion sort of right has in a way been, been proven wrong. Um, my comments referred more to the, uh, I, I linked this uh, sort of right, uh, period more to the sort of right to the intra, in a way, elite conflict that is happening sort of now. Um, and sort of right, so in a way where I come in or where sort of right, my worry comes in is more having sort of right, I mean, again, thinking about the effort to delegitimize of course, I mean, President Biden is going to be, um, um, you know, um, be our next president. Uh, okay, but still, right? I mean, if you look at the surveys today, 30% or more uh, of voters still, right, believe that, uh, the, uh, you know, he, this is not a legitimate president. Okay, so uh, because kind of, right, I mean, these whole strategies that um, that have been sort of, right, that, that Trump has used during the campaign about sort of, right, uh, invoking fraud, have resonated with some voters. So the concern here is more about, um, you know, uh, right, shrugging off this, um, this, um, uh, you know, um, illegitimacy kind of image in a way. Um, and sort of again, and if we look at sort of right, I mean, the book by, by Nancy Bermeo that I mentioned, or sort of right, everything we know in comparative politics. I mean, I, and I don't like to use this comparison, Weimar Germany, but in Weimar Germany, the problem was that sort of right, a significant part of the population never thought that democracy was legitimate. And that sort of right, it was never possible 
for the democratic kind of group um, in, um, in the society at the time to sort of shrug off that um, that sort of red image. So it is a very risky, um, you know, strategy. Once sort of right, this uh, this is on the agenda, and once sort of right, you fight about this, and um, you know, and sort of right, based on what we know, this this uh, sometimes you know, sort of right, it's it's just not possible, and it doesn't end well. Okay, so so I think kind of we are commenting on on different um, on different parts of the um on, uh, of the sort of right of the election and um and sort of right it is still sort of right, very hard to see sort of right what's going to happen sort of right looking forward um okay and sort of right i mean in kind of you know um um with with this sort of right with these uh with these voters so that's right. so uh, i think this is where the disagreement uh, thanks uh, let's hear david do you have a response do you want, would you like just to give a response to that and then if anyone else wants to comment yeah, just a little bit it's that it's unsettling when you get a, a fair proportion or don't think an election was legitimate it's unsettling it has, it's happened rarely in american history it happened last time you probably get more than 30% after last time. Most of the election outcome is not legitimate, but we've gone past it. I hope now that the, the fever going down, that uh, all this will go away. I don't think our uh, comparisons with my chart with Weimar, Weimar and its collapse make any sense at all. The economy had gone down to zero in 1931. The parliament had a majority of parties who were, who were anti-democratic in what they professed. There's nothing like those things going on in the U.S. today. Uh, okay, I have, I have a feeling this could go back and forth for some time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, move on to another question or another another comment, or if there is one, if not, we'll move to another question. Seeing no comment, let me ask um, Saad a question, uh, a COVID question. Saad, um, you mentioned uh, I think the sad facts of the U.S.'s uh, performance metrics that they're very they're very poor. Um, on the on the on COVID, so um, we have two more months until um, it looks like I guess that according to this panel, uh, Joe Biden will be the president. Um, so let's just stipulate that's the case. Um, so Joe Biden's going to be the new president. But what can Joe Biden do now? I mean, are we waiting two months? Well, if you were Joe Biden, Saad, um, what would you do tomorrow? Uh, uh, to um, to address the pandemic. Well, uh, so thank God I'm not Joe Biden. But um, in terms of um, the what can be done and what should be done, um, both on the domestic front and, and on the on the global front, um, because there is a, an opportunity that will be lost uh, if we don't we're not at the table um, for you know in the next two three months, uh, and I'll come to that in a second. But domestically. Uh, we need to have a, and I can go on and on for the whole response, but I'll focus on vaccines for now. Um, first of all, the idea is to have a national communication and education campaign. Um, uh, that's one thing, um, which is based, which has three goals. One, that it should be at scale. So one thing in public health, which I call pilotitis, is we keep on doing successful pilots uh, and not, you know, it's almost a disease that, you know, we don't scale up to to national level impact. So so uh, avoid the temp temptation of, uh, you know, doing things here and there. Be ready for a national level campaign um, um, at scale. Uh, it should focus on trust. Um, it should... That also engage communities. And the first and the last one is not at odds. There are ways to engage communities at scale if you have a template. Community organization is done at scale for all sorts of things. Um, and more voter mobilization is one example, uh, but it's not the only example. Uh, so these should be the goals, and it should be science-based. We should be ready for, uh, uh, for now. They should get ready now for, for that kind of a campaign. Uh, they should decide on the fate of Operation Warp Speed uh, from now uh, and send it back to the agencies, perhaps, um, uh, or have a more um, sort of career folks involvement. By the way, it already has uh, pretty substantial uh, career involvement, and the, even the outside person who co-leads this is, uh, you know, is fairly mainstream. And and actually, if there is a um, a counterfactual to uh, things not being handled by Jared, it's Operation Warp Speed. 
other than the name, uh, it has produced, it is uh, bringing together the agencies, uh, public health agencies and other government agencies, NIH, BARDA, FDA, CDC, around an umbrella, have a coordination uh, by people who know what they are t- talking about. Um, and, and look, uh, it has been, yes, the, the naming could have been different, um, uh, et cetera. They could have paid more attention to communication, but in terms of developing a vaccine, it's been it's been a reasonable success. Uh, but but they need to decide on that. What happens afterwards? How did they mount a national response, uh, not just a federal response? So engagement of uh, and the way it can happen is engage non-governmental professional associations for now, um, like the um, Association of State and Territor- Territorial Health Officers. That's out there. There's nothing stopping a campaign uh, from engaging with them directly. The Association of Immunization Managers is out there. Um, Engagement of um, companies, uh, the Infectious Disease Society of America, the American Medical Association, all of that, you don't have to run a shadow government for two months, but you can get ready for these kinds of things uh, when, uh, you know, for, for January. Great. The, Thank yeah. you so, thanks a lot, Sad. Um, and then I, I'd like to um, ask Christina and Jacob. Um, so David laid out um, a, a, a scenario where very little uh, of the of what you might call the progressive agenda um, becomes law uh, in a Biden administration. Um, Christina, um, you're an expert on appointments, the bureaucracy. Um, can you tell us um, how that might work um, under divided government, or especially if, if the, the Republicans remain in control of the Senate. And then um, after Jacob, if you could say a word about whether you concur um, with David regarding, I guess it's HR1 and all of its um, uh, political reforms, as well as all the legislative reforms. Do, do you concur with David regarding what, what is likely to transpire in terms of the Democrats' um, political reform and legislative agenda. So Christina and then Jacob. And then um, after that, I think we'll open it up to questions from our our audience. So I'm going to be going afterward right to the uh, Q&A function. Thank you. Well, great. Yeah. So um, the first of all, uh, I think, you know, David, recognizing that uh, the likelihood of legislation being stymied in Congress is pretty high, particularly given, uh, you know, the small margins. And so Really, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be administrative policy making that's going to be the the way forward. And even in a situation where you have a Senate, uh, say Georgia doesn't end up uh, uh, turning it, both of its special elections towards the Democrats, but instead the Republicans hold them. There are the vacancy, the Federal Vacancies Reform Act allows for a considerable amount of time after inauguration for acting appointees to serve. And we've already seen that the public really doesn't have a huge issue with the major management of, of the federal government being uh, individuals who don't have Senate confirmation. If they had had that, with it peppered across the news, you you would imagine there being some type of pushback against Trump, and and there just hasn't been uh, uh, from from his Republican base or really from from much of the Democratic base outside of the the really controversial ones like Chad Wolf and like the the newest uh, shuffle at at the Department of Defense. But the federal the FVRA allows uh, for 300 days. For an, for an acting uh, uh, in, uh, appointee to serve after inauguration. And then an additional 210 days if a Senate uh, nominee is submitted and not confirmed. And then another 210 days after that. So if you're keeping track at home, that's nearly 720 days of interim appointees. And that almost gets us to midterms. So there are a lot, there's going to be a lot of places uh, for administrative policy making to be led by the Biden administration. It just won't be led by the Biden administration with the Senate's consent, which that in and of itself, we can have a whole other conversation about. <laughs> yeah, it. so very quickly, I mean, first of all, David, David was my dissertation advisor. And I think there, there is a, there's like a, you know, if there's the Reagan's rule was thou shalt not criticize a fellow Republican, uh, th- thou shalt not criticize their dissertation advisors pretty high up there. 
Um, but but I'll say that I I haven't put my concerns about democratic backsliding into my file cabinet. I think it's very much front and center still. And I was and I my greatest regret about the election, honestly, is that you know. Uh, there, there, there looks to be very limited scope to pursue some sensible democratic political reforms, small d democratic political reforms. And, and to me, the, the, um, everyone knows what the big ones should be. It's not court packing. It's not Puerto Rico and DC statehood, though I would be supportive of the, of the latter. Um, it's making sure that every American has the right to vote. And that politicians uh, are prevented or re- at least have reduced capacity to choose their voters rather than um, than voters choosing them through extreme partisan gerrymandering. So um, the prospects for those things are, are dismal. But I, I think one thing that Democrats should recognize is that fighting a, um, a fighting the good fight is sometimes good politics, too. I would push for these. And I think that's why Senate control is crucial. It's Joe Manchin's going to prevent, I mean, my public option does not look to have the greatest prospects uh, in Joe Manchin's Senate, but if the agenda is held, is controlled by Democrats because they have the Senate majority, um, then there will be the prospect for bringing these things uh, before the Congress, before the American people and having that debate, which I think we should have. On broader policy changes, I mean, Saad is right. I mean, we're we're living in an alternative reality show where a significant chunk of the political class is pretending that um, that, that what's happening, uh, that what Donald Trump believes is happening is, uh, or at least are not pushing back against his belief about what's happening. And in the real world, people are dying um, and they're dying because we're not having, we're not having an effect. We haven't had an effective policy and we're not going to have an effect, effective policy. We're going to have a failure of, of, we're not going to be able to formulate an effective policy if we can't have a, a transition that moves forward smoothly or if we don't have any capacity for, uh, for, for the incoming president to govern. Now, I'm hopeful that at least on the really fundamental things that seem that need to happen, then uh, that that will happen. But I, I thought Saad put it really well that, you know, the, the, we have seen some, some pockets of competence and, and Operation Warp Speed. Um, I agree on the name. I think we can call the rest of the the, uh, the COVID policies Operation Death Star, maybe. Um, but anyway, um, let me just end by saying that um, that uh, that that I that I think that the, the 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 biggest silver lining in this, and it was mentioned in the Q and A, is that we are going to turn the corner, and we're more likely to do so faster if we have some effective leadership. And so there, this may not be a typical midterm, right? Um, it's A, not going to feature a lot of polarizing legislation, and it's B, going to feature a big significant reversal in our situation, which may well um, make it more likely that, um, that, that the, the president-elect will be in a better position um, than he might be otherwise um, in a few years. So, um, thank you very much, Jacob. Okay, so I'm going to go, some of the question and answer, um, some of the Questions have been answered uh, uh, during the comments on, on the panel. Um, other others are less so. Um, I'm going to try and kind of weave my way through the questions. So um, here's a question. Um, I guess I'll, I'll direct this first at David and then at the anyone else who wants to wants to participate. Um, question is: Do you think there'll be any legislative common ground between President Joe Biden and a Republican Congress? So this is in the event that. That um, you know the that the uh, Republicans get one of the two Georgia seats. Um, you, you mentioned all the things that weren't going to happen. Can you say a bit about um, what you think might might happen? And then, of course, anyone else who wants to comment uh, would be welcome. Well, for one thing, there always has to be common ground ultimately on budgeting. And budgeting has to take place every year, and budgeting is commonly a, a consequence of. Um, of things both parties tuck into a large instrument so that you get common ground in that sense that's very important a lot of policy making is done in the budgets another thing is that i think biden as everybody says biden is very good with dealing with people on capitol hill and probably i'm not sure about this with uh with mcconnell that is that it's i mean there's there there are, good, there are better vibrations there than we've seen in some years between the senate leader and the president probably anyway I think there there are some there are some policy areas in which there might be some fruitful 
uh, cooperation between them. I mean, infrastructure is one. Everybody talks about infrastructure, but nobody's got a plan. And no, certainly nobody's got a plan for paying for it. But it is an area in which nonpartisan activity can happen. So if they put their heads to it, it's possible they can do something on that front. But um, any, I, I can't actually see as well because I've got this question and answer screen that I that's sitting in front of, of some of the panelists. I don't see anyone else wanting to comment on this, so we'll move on to the next question. So the next question is is one about the the uh, kind of the generally political coalitions. Um, the the questioner asks about exit poll data regarding independent voters. I'll just read the question and I, I'll, I'll ask you to comment on the more this issue and as well as its implications more generally. But here's the question. I've seen exit poll data that independent voters generally perceive Democrats to care more about social issues and Republicans to care more about economic issues in 2020. And the conventional wisdom is that voters tend to prioritize economic issues over social foreign policy issues at the ballot box. I've also seen some high profile left leaning pundits believe this explains Democrats sliding among non college educated Latinos in 2020. Is this exit poll data considered high quality? If so, is this something the Democratic Party should aim to crack? So um, if anyone wants to address that particular aspect of the political coalitions, that would be great. Um, if you would like to also address more generally um, the question of what might, we, we don't, I don't know that we do have really reliable exit poll data for a variety of reasons, but we do have some, begin, we're beginning to see what data from precincts um, and from um, from counties and, and house districts and things like that, that, that does seem to indicate um, uh, some uh, some shifts in the Republican voting coalition. Uh, would anybody like to comment on on this question, also informed by by other data about how the Republican voting coalition um, might have changed uh, over this um, over the the last several years, and, and as evidenced in this election. I, well, yeah, as you can see, some of this, uh, excuse me, okay? Excuse yeah, me. yeah, please, fire away. You see some of this on the map. I mean, you go to South Texas and South Florida, you can see on the map right. that the Democrats did worse than they expected and usually have done among Hispanic voters. That isn't to say that most Hispanic voters don't still vote Democratic. They do. But nonetheless, at the edge, you see it on the map. It's not just exit polls. Right. Um, any any comments about the? So we're going to actually have a, a whole a whole panel on this sort of voting behavior. These voting behavior questions in two weeks, and we have um, uh, some amazing people who are you know experts on that nitty gritty of um, of these sorts of questions. Um, that doesn't mean that others don't have opinions that they might want to share and but I'm looking at the panel um, I, I want to as a, I am not an election expert and Isabella did you want to jump in I see your mute is off no okay so I'm not an election expert I actually am really looking forward to that panel I, I I would just say three quick things one is given how far the polls were off in general um, and we'll surely have a discussion of that at the next panel um, I would be I would be careful about exit polls right now. Second, um, it it's not going to come to, to it, it's not it's it's not going to be the case that we're going to have seen a fundamental shift in the bases of these parties. Right? We're talking about enormous continuity, and indeed, I mean, I really do think the the central fact of American politics today that we saw is both sides were able to get lots of people out, but the persuasion was operating on a very small segment of the electorate, right? And the degree to which there is a chunk of, the, this is something Isabella noted in comparative, the degree to which, despite an a enormous catastrophe, electoral alignment seem fairly stable is, is itself a very remarkable feature. And the third thing I would say is that, you know, wherever it came from, Joe Biden put together a pretty effective map. And it looks especially remarkable when you compare it with the rest of the Democratic um, electoral candidates, the rest of the candidates, right? He, okay. he got, that, that's, a, that's, I mean, that's why he's going to be the next president, right? Right. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, another question. Um, 
uh, self deprecate it has a self deprecating part. This might seem a terribly uninformed question. Okay. It's actually, I think, a good question. Um, and Isabella, you might have something to add to this, um, uh, uh, and others, I think, as well. But why do we need to have this transition system when other countries have the newly elected head of state taking office the very next day? Um, what's up with that? Uh, this transitions, this, this two and a half, whatever month transition system. It, it is a little strange, isn't it? Um, Isabella, could you just put this in comparative perspective? And then David, anyone else who wants to comment, that would be great. I'm looking for maybe Professor Mayhew knows more. Not being an expert on American politics, it seems to me this isn't this a legacy of the electoral college and the fact that sort of right you had these institutions where they had to gather together and sort of come. So it's just this historical accident, I think, kind of that is connected to the electoral college that sort of right that creates this uh, you know this kind of lag that we. You're yes. So so um. I think Isabella's frozen, not me. Is Isabella yeah. frozen? Okay. It's usually me. <laughs> I'm sure Christina or David can tell the yeah, basic. I was say, David, do you want to jump in and then Isabella can catch up or Christina? If I can comment. Format and the sort of right then well, and you know, what has happened to these efforts historically, because probably we're not uh, at the only moment in history when we are kind of agonizing, <laughs> about, you know, having to wait for uh, two months. Um, the, the, uh, I mean, the Great Depression, well, that was a, was a big one with Hoover Roosevelt. But David, do you have a comment you'd like to make? Well, that's a good question. And I don't, maybe we don't need long transitions. It, 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 it's, it's easy to see why it's there than why it should be there. As it's a hangover from the 18th century. Originally, they had a longer transition. It was from early November to early March, and then they collapsed it a bit. But the collapsed two months uh, uh, delay is a, is, is, is a residue. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe there's no good reason for it. Maybe it has something to do with presidencies, but I don't know that. Presidencies general, I just don't know. Christina, is there something you'd like to add? Yeah, I think also a lot of it in parliamentary systems, you have shadow governments, you have minority governments that have their own shadow ministers that are involved in the process of administrating the government, whereas in our system, we don't have that. We don't have a Democratic or, or Republic opposite party secretary of state or an opposite party uh, secretary of transportation. And so the transitions actually starts well before the election. The transition starts, is, is, is legally mandated to start six months before the election. And that's when the, uh, the, the individuals who are currently in the administration, uh, they, they get together, they find their leaders within each department who will lead the transition and they create documents, they create transition landing manuals in order to inform the new administration not only of, of the status quo of policies and regulations that are still in play or still being processed, but also just who people are and where the positions are. There's a, the um, plum book as a, as it's called is, is a, you know, 600 page document uh, book that's published every four years, giving way to the, all of the appointments that need to be made by a new administration. And because of the way that we've set up our, our federal appointment system, the new administration has to come in and fill all of those spots. And so not only f figure out what spots there are and who is filling them, but then also where, what kind of world those people are leaving and whether or not they even want those people to leave. Oftentimes we have a lot of holdovers that, that hang on after the transition because, um, because it, it takes so much time to get your feet under you. And it looks like one of those holdovers this year will be Donald J. Trump. <laughs> So it's actually an interesting thing. I, I guess um, because it's not a party system, the how would the shadow, you know, the shadow cabinet work with because it's it, this shadow cabinet's associated with a political party. We don't know who the nominee is until the, the summer. They would have to then put together the shadow, you know, the shadow cabinet. I, I would imagine unless that's something the voters expect and demand people have all sorts of reasons not to want to have to put forth the shadow cabinet, uh, if, unless they were compelled to by, 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 uh, public pressure, because the folks are then vulnerable to all of the, you know, this was, I remember I worked on a political campaign where people, uh, were suggesting the presidential candidate name 10 people who might be the 
possible vice presidential nominees. And, and we were petrified that it would both be ridiculous and also open each of those people up to a withering attack. Um, if they were, if they were named, they would have a, have a, a target put on their back. Um, if they, once their name was, um, names were released. Okay. Let's uh, get a few more questions in. I'm going to go to the bottom here and let's see what we've got. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. Here's here. Okay. Here's a question. Uh, Professor Kinane, are there cabinet seats that are critical to fill quickly? So while I'm looking at the other questions, what are the cabinet seats that need to be filled right away? All of them. <laughs> All of them. Okay. You, you, you care to I mean, elaborate? <laughs> I, certainly. Um, I, typically, you know, secretary, I, the, first of all, there's, there's, you know, the line of succession is, of course, uh, in, important to, to recognize uh, uh, in, you know, in, in oftentimes uh, cabinet positions are confirmed kind of in order of, of where they sit in the succession line, uh, being Secretary of State first. Um, but we face, we, we face, as, as Saad has said, we face a world of just epic proportions of mortality and morbidity that needs to be addressed immediately. So really you need a you need you need a Department of Homeland Security and you need a Department of Health and Human Services like on day minus two, right? Like you need someone who is facilitating and coordinating this this massive scale intervention that needs to happen. Um, not only uh, for vaccinations, but also for the fact that you have an entire disinformation campaign to overcome. You need to you need to inform people that their hospitals are at max capacity and what that means for them. The fact that just because you aren't experiencing or, or don't believe that COVID is is a, a thing that happens or a thing that will affect you doesn't mean you won't at one point potentially need to be in a hospital. Like we should all stop driving our cars if there's no ICU beds in case we get in a car accident. We should we should watch out for all of the individuals who have heart conditions that won't go to that won't seek health care because either they can't because hospitals are full or because they are afraid of, 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 of the risk of catching COVID. And so you have, you have, as Saad so nicely put, you have this need for an administration that is not only working, but is on the ground. And, and so interior is important. It's always going to be important. It might be less important in terms of, of dealing with the, 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 the situation at hand. Thank, thank you very much, Christina. Okay, so in our in our final um, few moments together, I, I just want to ask the group, um, maybe in in order of appearance uh, uh, on the panel, um, what are where do you go um, personally uh, uh, for information um, in this in this uh, uh, in this time of of great um, great great national upheaval and political change? Um, what, where do you seek out information and what have you read recently? Uh, uh, a book or an article or two, um, that has informed the way you think about politics that you would recommend to interested members of, of our audience here. Um, uh, what would be a really interesting thing to, to read? Like, I, I think Isabella mentioned Nancy Bermeo's work and, and it's, it's, um, that's, you know, deep scholarship that's also of, of relevance. So, so what, what might you recommend to our, to our community? Um, so we'll just start with Jacob and go in order of, of appearance. Um, yeah. So, um, I would recommend probably spending less time on Twitter and, um, and more time talking to people. Um, but, uh, what I found, I found, you know, it's going to be predictable, but I found it really helpful to have, um, the very regular updates that the Times is providing, as well as the long form journalism that's been appearing in the in the Atlantic, I think has been excellent during this crisis. Um, I would speaking of another long form journalist, I would read Jane Mayer's wonderful piece about Mitch McConnell that appeared um, er earlier this year. <laughs> we'll see how relevant it's going to be. And um, 
book that really influenced me, I've actually told a number of people this, and that, uh, I'm not sucking up to my uh, senior colleagues, um, Jim Scott's Against the Grain, which is really a remarkable book. It's a lot of it's about the way pandemics have reshaped society. So I recommend it highly. Great. Thank you, Jacob. Um, I, I forget who was second. Was it Christine? Christina? Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you, Jacob, uh, about staying off of Twitter. Although I do have to say, and, and I think that, that, you know, um, as, as not certainly one of the armchair uh, epidemiologist that saw uh, railed against. I definitely feel that getting into epi Twitter uh, made me epically more aware of the oncoming uh, uh, pandemic uh, it, back in in February and March than than probably I would have been elsewhere. So so I, I must say that there is an incredible information campaign that is happening by epidemiologists uh, to their absolute credit on Twitter. Um, there's a lot of work. Um, that that has been done um, uh, to to accumulate data and to accumulate knowledge in really readable form. So I I mean I agree with you that Twitter is by and large bad uh, for 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 making for for your blood pressure I think but um, but but for uh, for information that you might not uh, uh, easily come in contact with I think you know getting into one of those circles is great. Um, in terms of books. Um, Will Howell and uh, Terry Moe's uh, newest uh, book on the presidency, um, I found uh, fascinating and infuriating at the same time, um, uh, mostly because it's about populist presidencies. And, and I think I would recommend that 100%. Um, so. Great. Thank you, Christina. Um, Isabella. Yes. So um, I uh, thank you for this question. It's actually very thought provoking. And so for me, um, I have um, been reading a lot of historical books on pandemics, uh, <laughs> just trying to understand. Uh, and one that um, I strongly recommend is um, uh, by, um, you know, a historian at UCLA. His name is Peter Baldwin, and the book is called Contagion and the State. And it is about sort of, you know, historical responses to health crises. Uh, so I would add that um, sort of right to the list of sort of also Nancy Bermeo, who, who is a, an author that I find sort of highly relevant today, that I mentioned at the beginning. Thank you very much, Isabella. David? I'll go to Jacob's room. You mentioned Jim Scott's book, and I agree with that one. But a book something like that, which I recommended to you, by the way, is by Walter Scheidel. Is an economic, hist economic history professor at Stanford. I can't remember the exact title, but I think it has equality in it or inequality it also has violence in it it's about oh, equality and inequality during the last 3000 years great thank you david and uh, saad so uh, i would recommend and i've been reading a bit um, not as much as i would have liked to um, because of some of the other stuff um, that i've had to do um, but um, i would say um, very earlier on early on i went back to uh, camus um, uh, the plague. Um, it's it's a classic, um, and and you know, and it's it. You know, I, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, you know, it almost gave me goosebumps uh, in terms of uh, you know earlier on, like how um, the more things change, the more they remain the same, um, etc. So I, I would suggest going back to that. Uh, the Atlantic has had some of the best writing on the pandemic. I absolutely agree, especially Ed Young's um, uh, work on it. It's very thoughtful. It's not um, at, at all superficial. Um, and, and the last thing I would say, if you care about institutions, read the long form article by ProPublica on CDC's uh, role on this. Take the time, um, read it, and then read it again. Um, because there are lessons for other institutions as well. So, you know, I'll, I'll pause here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time to um, to to join together this evening for this conversation. Um, I hope everyone uh, in the audience appreciated it as much as I did. Um, I'd like to once again uh, advertise uh, we're going to do this again in a slightly different way. In two weeks, um, we're having a session. What did voters do? And why did they do it? Another panel discussion sponsored by ISPS. Um, with that, I'd like to, uh, again, thank the panelists, thank Pam Green and Lamore Peer, um, who worked to set up today's event, and thank you all for joining us. I look forward to seeing you at future ISPS events. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.
बाय बाय